<laughs> that passing we have for him is all rubber, so he drops it and you have no idea which direction it's going to bounce. And it could bounce 15 feet any, in any direction. <laughs> anyway, Whew, okay, deep breath. Good evening. It's good to see you all out here uh, tonight. Um, honestly, I mean, if the ratios were still the same for our normal Sunday morning attendance versus what we are right now, we're about 50%. If we could get that every Sunday night from our average Sunday morning attendance, I think that would be good. But this morning we had about 55, I think, and tonight we have about 20-something. So, <laughs> just hold 26. So, a little bit more than 50%. Mm -hmm. Or a little less. A little less. I, I'm a preacher. I don't do math. <laughs> One and a half PBS. <laughs> Preachers count 50%. Anyway, so that's besides the whole point. Um, Tonight we're going to be continuing this series that Lance has started, looking into the heart, talking about that one thing. That one thing. What's that one thing? What is that one thing? We're going to be talking about the cost of discipleship, the heart of a disciple. Of a disciple. Um, so if you would, let's start off with a prayer. God, we thank you so much for the blessing of today. Um, Lord, we see your power in the seasons. Lord, in the, in, in the change of weather, we see you at work, because we know that you set those in place. Lord, and we just, um, we see the beauty in, in the winter. Even though things seem dead, they seem cold, bitter, and gray, there's still beauty, there's still life in that, Lord. Um, we pray for safety for all those that are on the roads tonight and, and during today. We pray that you will return us all home safe, safely through it, oh Lord. Um, as we look at your scriptures tonight, help us to uh, discover a little bit about what it takes to have the heart of a disciple. Really start to look into our own hearts and see if we have that heart of a disciple that it takes. In your son's name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn over to uh, Luke chapter 10. That's where we're going to begin tonight. Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 57. That one thing. Um, I read a book recently. It, it was written a, in the last year or two by a guy named Kyle Eidelman, a preacher at a church down in uh, Kentucky, in the Louisville area. And it's called Not a Fan. Not a Fan. Have any, any of you heard of that book? Not a Fan. It's a pretty popular book out right now. Um, it, a little bit more devotional type book, um, really challenging stuff though. But he compares fans and followers, saying that he looks around. I mean, his congregation that he's at is thousands. It's one of those mega churches there, and so he looks at the thousands of people that are gathered every Sunday in, in their worship center, and he wondered. He was wondering to himself, how many of these folks under my care? are really learning what it takes to be a follower of Jesus? Or are they simply a fan? Who has a favorite sports team? What's your favorite sports team? Anybody? Anybody? No sports? St. Louis Cardinals. Got any Cubs fans? We can battle it out right here. Uh, let's see. Any Bears fans? Packers fans? <laughs> That's another one of those. Rivalries. Everybody loves a good rivalry. Um, I'm a football fan. Like I just enjoy watching the game. I'm a fan of the game of football. Not really a baseball or basketball or hockey or really any other sport. I mean, I'll watch the Olympics. I'll watch a little bit of the World Series, maybe. Um, I'll watch some uh, World Cup soccer. Uh, those are fun sports to watch. But I'm a fan of football. Fan. Are, are you a fan? Um, a fan is short form of the word fanatic, and the definition, as if you need one, an ardent admirer of a pop star, film actor, football team, etc., or a devotee of a sport, hobby, etc. Now, question. How many Justin Bieber fans do we have out here? 
Haley shaking her head. No, no, absolutely not. We live in a world that's, that is obsessed with celebrities. I mean, I have my favorite actors. I have a, you know, if I know of an act of a movie that's going to have a certain actor or be uh, have a certain director in charge of it, that's probably a movie I'm going to want to go see. I'm a fan of that actor, or that director. I'm, I'm a fan of a certain music group, but I'm not devoted to them. And there's a difference between knowing about someone and, and knowing someone. We can know all the facts about Justin Bieber. The fact is, you're never going to know Justin Bieber. What about with Jesus? You can know all there is to know about Jesus. You can have seen all the history special, History Channel specials. You can have seen all the things on Discovery that are just all those out there theories. You can know every single thing that every person has to say about Jesus. So you can know a lot about Jesus without ever knowing Jesus. You can be a fan of Jesus without being a follower. Jesus, all throughout his ministry, had thousands of fans. Thousands. You read through the, especially the Gospel of Mark, makes it very clear that he was swarmed with people. Huge crowds followed him wherever he went. There was one time he was teaching and healing on one side of the Sea of Galilee, and he got tired, so he and his disciples, his true followers, those that really knew him, set off on a boat. And when, they, when the crowds saw where he was going, they ran around the edge of the Sea of Galilee to try to meet him on the other side. He was a celebrity. He had celebrity status there in Galilee. He had thousands of fans, but very few followers. So are you a fan or are you a follower? Um, what a follower is, is really summed up really well in this uh, Chris Tomlin song, I Will Follow. If you listen to uh, Caleb or Air One, some of the Christian stations, you've probably heard this song before. Uh, we've sung it at a few youth rallies. Uh, it's a great song, and this is the chorus. It says, where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. Who you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. If this life I lose, I will follow you. Yeah, I will follow you. Wherever. Even if I have to lose this life. Because honestly, this life is worth losing if it's lost in following Christ. So are you a fan or are you a follower? What's that one thing? It's just one thing. This brings us to our passage tonight in Luke. We're going to look at some others too. But in Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62, it says, As they were walking along the road, that's Jesus and his uh, disciples, as they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I'll follow you wherever you go. That sounds just like the song we just saw. I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I'll follow you, Lord, but... First, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Ouch. Some of these things that Jesus replies are very hard to swallow. And it's just one thing with, with each of these three encounters. Each of these three people wanting to be a follower, but there's... One thing holding them back. The first one comes, I'll follow you wherever you go. To which Jesus replies, you know I'm homeless, right? The implication in the text is that that was enough to make the man not follow. We don't read anything about him leaving his home and following a homeless rabbi. 
You know I'm homeless, right? Which raises the question, what are you willing to give up to follow Jesus? Are you willing to give up your three-bedroom, two-and-a-half bath, detached, single family home in the suburbs? To move to an inner city, one-bedroom, studio-style apartment? That's a tough question for even me to answer. Will you follow Jesus there? Will you leave this life of luxury here in the United States and follow Jesus to a third world, third world isn't really PC now, to a developing country where you might be living in a one-room hut with a thatched roof and dirt floor with no running water, no plumbing, no electricity, no internet. <gasps> Will you follow him there? Jesus is starting to weed out the fans versus the followers. And this next guy, this, this is an even tougher one to handle. The next guy comes up and says, Jesus calls him out. He calls him, singles him out of the crowd and says, follow me. He doesn't do that with a whole lot of people. Only 12 that we know of. That he's specifically called out and said, follow me. So he does this to another unnamed man. He says, follow me. But the guy replied, first, let me go and bury my father. Now, this doesn't mean that his father is a corpse in, you know, in the morgue, just waiting to be stuck six feet under. He's not saying, Jesus, yeah, I'll come follow you. Just give me a day to go have a funeral and, you know, put my father in the ground, throw some dirt on him, and then I'll be right with you. To them, burying my father meant his father was still living. The, the idea behind this in, that, in this culture was, yeah, I'll follow you, but let me go back and fulfill my duties as a son, as long as my father is living. That's where my devotion lies. And once he's dead, however long that takes, as soon as he dies and I get my inheritance and we get the whole estate squared away, then I'll come follow you. It could have been years, decades even. Who knows how long? So Jesus replies, let the dead bury their own dead. The, the idea is the spiritually dead. Let those who are not even following me, not even interested in following me. Let them take care of themselves. He says, but you go and proclaim the kingdom. We never hear of him again. He's never named. So a, the implication is that that was too hard. He couldn't let go. He had family obligations to take care of before he would make a full commitment to God. And I'm sure most of you know, you know, a lot better than I do from experience, but even I'm figuring it out. It's really, really hard to be 100% devoted to Christ no matter what when you've got a family to take care of. That's why Paul himself remained, uh, made the decision to remain unmarried. It's really hard to balance following Christ and loving your family. And Jesus had some very, very tough teachings about that very issue. The whole idea of, unless you hate your mother and father more than me, you are not worthy of me. Really? Are you willing to follow Jesus even if it means turning your back on your family? That's a hard one. I don't know what I would answer if he called me to do that very thing. And then finally, there's this third encounter. So another said, I'll follow you, Lord. First, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. First, let me go. Oh, again, that sounds all well and good here. Let me, you know, I'm out at the mall. I see this guy who says, hey, come with me to California. And I'm like, okay, first, let me go say goodbye to my family. And then I'll follow. Not really. Again, it's lost in the culture. Here, there would have been a huge 
send-off party, a huge going-away party. It could have lasted weeks. Saying goodbye could have taken a really long time, weeks, months, to get everything set in order, to have the going-away parties, and say goodbye to you, not just your parents and your brothers and sisters, but also all your extended family. It would have been, the whole town probably would have come together for a send-off. It, no. No. Jesus says, you can't, Drive looking in the rearview mirror. Nobody sets their hand to the plow and looks back as worthy of me. You can't plow a straight line always looking back behind you. Just like you can't drive down I-74 bridge looking in your rearview mirror. You will get in a wreck. You can't, you can't drive when you're constantly looking back. The other implication is that he wants people to know. He wants everybody to know that he's going away. He wants to say goodbye to everybody. He wants to spread the word as to what he's doing. He wants all the, the fame, the glory, and the honor of, hey, I'm going to go follow Jesus. No. You can't keep doing that. Mark 10. One more encounter. That one thing. Mark chapter 10. Another well-known passage to most of us, I'm sure. Mark 10, 17 through 31. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I've kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and, looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. The disciples were amazed at his word. But Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And we'll stop right there. We'll pick up the last few verses there in just a minute. So this, this man, commonly known as the rich young ruler, runs up to Jesus and says, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And all of Jesus responds, Why do you call me good? Why do you flattery, really? Come on, I'm the son of God. You don't need to flatter me. There's only one who's good. That's God. Now, on with your question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? To which Jesus replies, simply, keep the commands. In Matthew's dialogue here, it's a, he asks, well, which commands? But here in Mark, he, Jesus goes on to explain, which commands? He says, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. And I add defraud in with steal. To defraud means to earn your wealth by taking from others. To lie, steal, and cheat to get ahead. That's defrauding. So that, I kind of lump that in with steal, even though it's not one of the Ten Commandments, really. It fits right in. Uh, see, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. He says, all these I've kept. Okay, the Ten Commandments. We technically split it up four and six. The first four deal with your relationship with God. You shall have no other gods before me. Don't make an idol. Uh, don't misuse the Lord's, the Lord's name. And keep the Sabbath. And the last six have to deal with your relationship with fellow man. All right, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't give false testimony, honor your father and mother. Which one did you leave out? 
covet. He doesn't say, you shall not covet. He leaves that one out. And the rich young ruler, with these commands, he says, all these I've kept. I've kept all these commands. I've done all of those. One thing you lack. Sell everything, give it to the poor, and follow me. I think that coveting held this man back. Sure, he might not have ever killed anybody, he might not have slept around with anybody, he might not have stealed and defrauded, he might have earned his money legally, honestly, with integrity. And Jesus doesn't say anything about those. He, he knows this man's heart. But even though he might have earned his wealth honestly, I think Jesus purposefully left out that command, you shall not covet. Because I think, given what Jesus tells him to do, I think that's the one that was tripping this man up, that was holding him back, coveting, wanting everything for himself, wanting to have the latest, the greatest, the nicest clothes, the biggest house, the finest chariot at that time, I guess. Um, the latest, greatest, biggest, best, keeping up with the Joneses, putting on a show. And Jesus knew his heart. So he said, one thing you lack. Sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and follow me. Now he doesn't give every single rich person this command. If he did, we would all be beggars, because we are all rich. By worldly, global standards, we are wealthy beyond belief. He doesn't give this command to just every single person. If you remember in his uh, encounter with Zacchaeus, the tax collector, he doesn't have to tell Zacchaeus to sell everything he has and give it to the poor. Zacchaeus just offers up the, the command to make things right. He says, yes, I've done this, I've stolen, I've cheated, and I'm going to make it right. He does it of his own accord. Jesus doesn't have to tell him to do anything. But to this rich young ruler, there was that one thing that was holding him back. His attitude, his coveting. So Jesus says, sell everything, give it to the poor and follow me. Because who's the true rich young ruler in this instance? It was Jesus. Jesus, when he was in heaven, he had it all. He had love, he had everything. This whole world is his. This whole world belongs to Jesus. He had all the power, all the authority, all the glory that is in God. He had everything, and he laid it all aside. He got rid of everything to come down to earth and live a life of poverty. Jesus was the true rich young ruler in this case. That's why he... It says he could look on this man and love him, or he looked on him with compassion, because he knew what it was like. He knew how difficult it was going to be to ask this man to do the very thing that he himself has already done. But it doesn't stop him. One thing you lack. What's your desire? This is a, a bust of Socrates the uh, famous Greek philosopher who um, was put to death by the state. Anyway, uh, Socrates. A story is told of Socrates that he was um, out in the marketplace doing his thing um, one day when a young man came up to him. He found Socrates out of the crowd and he got his attention. He said, Socrates, Mr. Socrates, I don't know if they have called him Mr., but uh, Mr. Socrates, I've traveled thousands of miles just to see you. I know you're a man of wisdom, I know you're a man of knowledge, and great understanding, and I want to have that kind of wisdom. Please, teach me. Socrates says, alright, follow me. So they walk out of the city, out to the country, down some hills, through a forest, down to a river. And they get to the river, and Socrates keeps going down into the river, walking down into the river, further further out, 
until they're about shoulder, length, shoulder deep into the river. He says, you want wisdom, huh? He says, yes, Mr. Socrates, yes, I want wisdom. Socrates says, okay. Grabs the man by the shoulders and shoves him under the water and holds him there. The man's flailing his arms, gasping, yelling, sputtering, trying to catch his breath, but he can't. He's just holding him under the water. 20 seconds, 30 seconds, 40 seconds, a minute. Gradually the flailing stops and the screams go away and he stops gasping for air and he falls limp. Socrates lifts him out of the water, drags him up to the shore, makes sure you know, he's still breathing, gets the air out of his lungs and stuff, and just leaves the unconscious young man right there on the shore. And then he goes back into the city. A few hours later, when the man wakes up, he, he shakes himself off, re, you know, regains his bearing, goes as quickly as he can back into the city, searching for Socrates, finds him again, and says, What was that about? To which Socrates says, while you were under the water, what thing did you want more than anything else in the world? He said, air! I wanted air! He says, until you want wisdom as badly as you wanted air, you're not ready to learn from me. How badly do you want to be a follower of Jesus? How badly do you want to follow Christ? Do you want it more than the air you breathe? Or is Jesus' words enough breath for you? What do you want more than anything else? What is your one thing that you desire? Philippians 3, 13 through 14, it says this. Uh, Paul writes here, he says, But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining Toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. One thing I do. Paul says, I'm not going to be that guy that puts my hands in the plow and looks back. I'm not going to drive looking in the rearview mirror the entire time. I'm going to forget what's behind. And Paul had a good life. Paul had it made. If he had stuck on the course that he was on, he would have been the next up-and-coming Top rabbi, top lawyer in all of Jerusalem. Yet he gave it all up. He gave up the fame and the fortune that would have gone along with it. We probably would have had other writings of his, but they would have been Jewish rabbinical writings. Instead of the New Testament like we have. It says, one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, forgetting all of that, I press on toward the goal, to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So what's your one thing? Think about that tonight. What one thing is keeping you a fan and not a follower? And I know in my audience tonight, it's not going to be probably some major, shocking, jaw-dropping sin. Most likely. Most likely you're not struggling with drug and alcohol abuse. You're not struggling with you know, sleeping around on your wife. At least I hope not. I mean, it's always a possibility. If it is, please come forward. But those aren't a lot of our sins in, in this room. A lot of us struggle with some of the very things we've seen tonight. What one thing is keeping you a fan and not a follower? Is it financial security? Are you waiting until you get the car paid off? Until you get the house paid off? Until you got your 401k fully funded? Until you retire? Until your kids retire? I don't know. Um, what are you waiting for? When will you be financially secure enough? Because honestly, that doesn't really matter to God. What's one thing that's keeping you a fan and not a follower? Is it your family? Is it your family obligations? Are you thinking, there's no possible way I could uproot my family and transport them to an inner city or transport them to a developing country to do the work of the kingdom? There's no way I would do that to them. My parents would flip. There's no way I would pursue that path. What one thing is keeping you involved? Is it comfort? Is it what you've, already, what you've always known? 
Is it, well, I come to church on Sundays. That's what I'm comfortable with. But do you ever go serve at the homeless shelter? Do you ever go volunteer somewhere? Do you ever get outside of your own comfort zone? Out of your little box that you've built yourself in with padded walls? And believe me, I'm talking every bit as much to myself as I am to anybody else in this room. Is it your past? Paul certainly could have let his past keep him from pursuing God. We you know Judas did. Peter could have. But forgetting what is behind, I press on to the goal. Do you let the things of your past keep haunting you and keep resurfacing in different ways and not just holding you back from taking that next leap of faith? <coughs> Hebrews 12, the writer says, to throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. Anything that's keeping you from running the race full steam, get rid of it. You wouldn't have, if you're in the Olympics, you would never run the 100 meter dash in snow boots and a big winter coat. They don't have that sport in the Winter Olympics. When you see those runners out on the track, they're, they're as aerodynamic as possible. They strip off everything that's going to hinder them from running as quickly as they can, from doing as well as they can in that race. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily ensnares us. What is that one thing for you? And what's your, what one thing must you do? What's your one thing? Find, what is your one thing in this life? What is your one thing that God has created you for? What is your one thing that God has called you for? That you've been putting off? Finishing up that section in Mark chapter 10. Peter said to Jesus, we've left everything to follow you. And Peter certainly had. Peter was married. Peter had a house. Peter had a job, a career even, his own fishing company as far as we can tell. He left it all to follow Jesus. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth. No one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields. And with them persecutions. And in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. What do you have to lose? What do you have to lose? In getting rid of that one thing that's holding you back, and pursuing that one thing to which he has called you. Jesus says, you've got nothing to lose, but everything to gain. Sounds like a no-brainer to me. Sounds like a no-brainer. What's your one thing? Do you really have the heart of a disciple, or are you just a fan? Are you a follower, or is there that one thing that's keeping you back from really going full board, following Jesus? If you need our prayers tonight, if we can help you in any way, won't you think about these things and come forward as we stand and sing this song?